Our next speaker is Dr. Meg McGrath from Cornell University based out of Long Island and she'll be discussing basal downy mildew and its occurrence across the United States. Thanks, Meg. Thank you, Andy. Is that good? Well, good morning, all. So we've uh, already mentioned that uh, basal downy mildew was first observed in the United States in October in 2007. Well, what about before then? There were a bunch of occurrences across Europe, starting with Switzerland in 2001, and then several other locations as well were reporting during the 2000s. Prior to that, there was one report of basal downy mildew in Uganda in the 1930s. Remains a mystery how we had no occurrences over all those many years and how we ended up to that point. But that's kind of some interesting background on basal downy mildew and its occurrence. So what does it look like? We'll give a little bit of background here on symptoms. Initially, you can just see some yellowing in crops. So for a number of growers the first year, just seeing some yellow, thinking they had a nutritional problem before they looked closely at the symptoms. Typical symptoms are yellowing on the leaves, um, often with this banded kind of a pattern. So you can see where it's part of the leaf is, is yellow. Here's a really good example where it's banded. And that's because this pathogen can't move across major veins, and that's typical of our downy mildews. But the really characteristic symptom is the sporulation on the underside of the leaves. So you can see the sporulation matches the banding on the top side of the leaves. And to look at it a little more closely with a good hand lens, this is what you'd see. You can see the fuzz on the lower surface where the spores are. And if you had a microscope, if you had a dissecting microscope, this is what you'd see. And a good compound microscope, this is what you'd see. It's kind of a tree-like structure that carries these spores, and they are dispersed by wind. And you get a lot of spores produced, which is part of the, the issue. We get a lot of spore production on these affected leaves. They're moved by wind. They can move long distances. This is certainly how this pathogen gets around. Typically, it's the lower leaf surface where we see sporulation. Occasionally, I've seen it on the upper leaf surface, particularly with a leaf that's curled, such as this one. But I've also seen sporulation on the top side of the leaf, when the leaf with a perfectly flat leaf. But most of the time, the sporulation's on the underside. A little bit of background on the pathogen. It is an obligate pathogen. That means it needs living host tissue to survive. Once basal dies over here up in the north over winter, the pathogen is gone, unless it's in the seed. So it can also be in seed. It does not, is not known yet to produce an OO spore. That's the result of sexual reproduction. Um, hasn't been found yet in the, U in the US or, or in the world. This was a thought that it might have been an occurrence in Israel, and there's some debate about that. So at this point, the pathogen is only reproducing with that asexual spore, cannot survive over winter it, when the plant dies. Host plants, basil is it. There was concern for a while that the new downy mildew on coleus was the same downy mildew. It has since been shown to be a different one. So the only host for this pathogen is basil. So what are our sources for the pathogen? This downy mildew can get in the seed, and that is most likely how it first got here to the U.S. and how it's gotten to various places. Seed is going to be particularly important for a greenhouse operation over winter, but most of the season it's going to be these wind-dispersed spores that are capable of moving long distances. And that's, there's so many spores, easily wind-dispersed, I think that is, is how it's getting around each year. Transplants are possible to have uh, plants that are already infected, and that has certainly been the case for some gardeners, but buying plants that are already effective. And then the other possibility is produce that's infected that's, that's getting shipped around. It arrives at a destination, and it now seeing the downy mildew, and it just gets chucked outdoors, and it's got spores on it. They could then move from there. So those are our possible sources each year. Um, what I've been doing is, is monitoring the occurrence of basal downy mildew. I have this web page uh, that's up on the internet, and if you click at this point, it will take you to where the reporting page is. And I've been doing this since 2009. The idea was just to get a feel for where basal downy mildew was occurring, see if we can kind of monitor where it's occurring, get a feel for how it's moving. Is it moving through the U.S. as uh, the cucurbit downy mildew does every year? That's one that survives over winter in Florida and is able to move completely up the East Coast each year. So we know these downy mildews are capable of moving long distances. Could this basal one do it? as well. 
The information that I asked for in these reports include the location, date when uh, the plants had symptoms, an estimate of when you thought the onset of the disease might have been, information about who's making the report um, to help me to be able to contact them, where it is, is it field, greenhouse, or garden, more, more information about the planting severity, how the reporter figured out what they had, um, whether or not I consider it a confirmation, and then there's a section on additional description and comments. And when I initially set this up, I was anticipating it was mostly going to be used by extension specialists, maybe a few growers, um, but it's predominantly been used by gardeners which has been kind of interesting. So here's just to show you a page and some of the information that shows up. There's a Google uh, page every year I set up for this. They remain on the web, so you can look at them at any point in time. And you can see some people put quite a few comments over here, which has been kind of interesting to get a feel for what people are seeing, control practices they've, they've found that work or don't work, um, when it came in, conditions. So that's been kind of a wealth of interesting information. I'm going to go through a series of maps that show where reports were. This is starting in 2008. Now this is not, this is a year before I started the monitoring program. So where reports came out that very first year in 2008 that we saw it beyond uh, Florida. So 2008, 2009, quite a few more reports. 2010, 2011, 2012, and realize these are all reports just to that monitoring page. I'm not including few, I've had some growers across the U.S. who have contacted me. I did not put that into this. Uh, 2013, and then last year, which was certainly by far our worst year for basil downy mildew. Interesting that it's the last year of our, or the year before our last year of our project, and it's our worst year. And not just the worst year in terms of number of states reporting, there was 35 states that reported last year, whereas previous years it was anywhere from 20 to 26, but number of reports that were logged on the internet just really skyrocketed last year to 284. Part of it, I think, is that we did have more plants that were being sold to gardeners in the spring. Um, so here's on Long Island, I went to a garden center, 13th of June, this is a Friday. Boy, those plants look great. But I know enough to look at the underside of the leaves. And there's downy mildew. So one question would be, was there good control in the greenhouse where these plants were being produced? But once they got to the garden center, downy mildew can now start taking off. Maybe the fungicides were no longer there and, and holding it back. And also I kind of wonder if we just had a year where there was more seed contamination, is that possible this past year? You think by now we've, we've gotten a good handle on it, but I had a number of growers on Long Island who came to me because they were seeing basil downy mildew really early, you know, April. That's well before they would have seen it because we had wind dispersed spores to the area. So this is Friday. I went back to the garden center on Monday. This is just three days later. There were not many plants left. Most of them were sold, so we got a lot of inoculum that's out there from these gardeners who have planted these plants. Um, this plant's fairly yellow. The picture doesn't do it justice here, but you look at the underside and there's just tons of sporulation. And the, the situation kind of reminded me of back in 2009 where we had the late blight epidemic on tomato transplants in the Northeast in that I took this one plant that was left in the store and I went up to the clerk and I said, I really want to play the dumb female we're kind of roll here. I really want a basil plant, but this is kind of yellow. Will it be okay? Oh, yeah, it'll be fine. It just needs a little fertilizer. I mean, obviously, the disease is there. Um, the same situation when I bought diseased tomato plants back in 2009. So, you know, that's an issue. Our garden center people don't recognize diseases, and, and they're willing to sell these plants. Um, this spring with the basil downy mildew, it was actually worse than the late blight epidemic back in 2009 in that it was more widespread that we had diseased plants. So I had reports from as far south as Tennessee of people finding plants in garden centers with uh, downy mildew. And it also occurred in Canada. One of their major producers was selling a lot of plants with basil downy mildew. So it was a big issue last year. I wonder, was it seed? Do we have a big issue with seed? The other thing I've kind of wondered is would basil downy mildew, you know, if it's occurring and if it's moving up the coast, it's moving around like cucumber downy mildew, I ought to see the two diseases at about the same time on Long Island. 
So this is in the Riverhead area where we've seen downy mildew on cucumber. I maintain a sentinel plot for that disease. And then basil. The first two years, these are reports from gardens, uh, typically my own. And then from there on in, it's when we've seen downy mildew at the research center where I'm working, which is where these cucumbers are. And you can see basil downy mildew is showing up pretty darn much the same time every year where there's a huge range with cucumber downy mildew from July 17th to September 3rd, September 7th rather over these years. That's a huge range in occurrence. That's suggesting to me that with the basal downy mildew we've got a lot more inoculum out there so it's not as dependent upon movement up the coast and it may also reflect that maybe this pathogen doesn't have as stringent requirements for environmental conditions as the cucurbit downy mildew pathogen. I'm just guessing. But it's interesting to see those differences in occurrence. And here is pulling all the years together um, of where we've had reports. And you can see the white states. There's only seven of them where there's been absolutely no reports of downy mildew all, uh, over all these years. That's a lot of places where we've had downy mildew. We've also had one report out of Alaska. That was a greenhouse. We've had some reports out of Hawaii and also out of D.C. So we got a couple states where every, all seven years there's been reports, and a number of states with six, five years of reports. Um, so basal downy mildew is clearly across the U.S. in occurrence. And realize, most of these are reports coming from gardeners. So maybe the issue is there is just gardeners not reporting from some of these other states. This shows you the number of reports that I've received total over all those years, from 2009 to, to 2014. Greatest number of reports coming from New York. Granted, some of those are mine, but I did not log 74 reports, I promise you. Um, Virginia's next, then Pennsylvania, Maryland, Florida, on down the line. Um, so, number of, of reports from several different states. I find basal downy mildew pretty widespread. Um, if you can find downy mildew in the Bronx, um, that's telling me that the pathogen's really getting around. No late blight on the tomatoes in the New York Botanical Garden, um, but those few basil plants, downy mildew had found those. And it gets into greenhouses pretty darn easily. So here we are in August, where there's plenty of downy mildew spores outside on plants that have basil downy mildew developing. This is microgreens, so they've just started up. I don't think this is a seed-borne issue because this grower was not seeing basil downy mildew during the uh, winter time. But once we get into a point in the season where there's a lot of spores outside, boy, that pathogen can just get into greenhouses pretty darn fast, pretty darn easily. Well, my focus here has been looking at basal downy mildew occurrence in the U.S. At my website, I have gotten a few reports from other areas, um, which have been kind of interesting. Greg came, and that's my own report. Um, but one that really interested me last year is there was a report from South Africa. And remember, South Africa was one of the other, you know, was a country that we'd had, well, Africa is a country that we, uh, that we had reports from way back. Um, so kind of wondering, hmm, what what's the situation's been in South Africa? So I tried to get a hold of some people there to try and find out, you know, is it current commonly there? What's happening in South Africa? Um, remember, first report there was 2005, but the person I got a hold of and talked to, um, or interacted by email, responded back that, oh, about 20 years ago, so that'd be 1994, he was dealing with a grower that was exporting basil to Switzerland as produce, and he was really battling basil downy mildew. So I wonder if that is how, because remember in Europe, Switzerland was the first country to have basil downy mildew. I wonder if that is how basil downy mildew first got to Europe, was actually on produce. So I'm going to end with just kind of a, a summary of, of various management tools, and then our, our presentations we'll get into next, we'll go over in more in depth with some of these. So what I recommend is starting with pathogen-free seed. This is particularly going to be important in a greenhouse operation where there's been a break in production and you're starting up and it's in the spring and so there's not a potential for spores to be blowing into the greenhouse. You can't hot water treat the seed because it exudes a gel and that makes it hard to work with. Um, but uh, ENSA has developed a seed treat, a steam treating procedure and that helps an awful lot for trying to clean up the seed. <clears throat> 
Less susceptible varieties and types is the next thing to consider. There is a, a sweet basil that's got a just kind of a moderate resistance that's out there, Eleonora, um, and the spice types are less susceptible. Next, particularly for gardeners, is starting with disease-free transplants. There was a case years back where um, some uh, production people with cucumbers brought in some plants from Florida. They had downy mildew. So there is a potential for a, a grower who's bringing in transplants. If they bring them in from an area where there's downy mildew, they could bring it in. So important to be inspecting those transplants. Another possible production me method is just focusing production when the risk of disease is low. Um, so for a greenhouse operation, focus on producing in the winter. Field production, focus in the spring because the disease tends to come in, in later. Of course, that doesn't work with the d demand for fresh market basil. There's demand year-round for the crop, so that makes it a little tough. But if you're growing basil for producing pesto or beer or anything else, focusing production early is going to help a lot. Uh, monitoring routinely, monitor that monitoring site I've got to know when and where basil downy mildew is occurring. That will help with, with considering a, a, a marketing of it pretty quickly. Then I got in bold and big print is fungicides. Um, that's going to be the most important management practice at this point in time. It's going to be critical to apply them preventively. In the greenhouse, reducing humidity is, is really key. If you can keep it down below 85%, which is real tough in the summer, but whatever you can do to keep the humidity down, you're going to control downy mildew. Some other things that have been looked at in Israel is lights on overnight. This pathogen needs a dark period in order to produce spores. So if you've got lights on and they've found it's during the first half of the night, you can prevent the pathogen from sporulating. And they did this work with plants that were already infected. And what's critical is to realize that this pathogen needs at least seven hours of darkness in order to produce the spores. The best type of light is red light, but they did it with regular white light as well. They've also done work looking at heat, this is pretty darn high, 113 Fahrenheit, but 48 hour period uh, treatment onto plants will kill the spores on the plants and uh, clean them up. And what they're doing in Israel is they've got net houses and they are solarizing them during the day. Once you see downy mildew destroying the crop promptly is gonna reduce inoculum, uh, being a good citizen, getting rid of it when it's out in the field so you've got less inoculum for other people, and then thorough sanitation following an outbreak, particularly in a greenhouse. Um, so I think hopefully that helps lead us into some management practices, and if we got a minute, I'd be happy to answer questions. Any questions for Meg? Go ahead, Dave. Meg, um, is there anything available for uh, large commercial growers that they can send their seed out to get tested, and if so, how long does it take? Is there any place to get seed tested? Um, it, it, indeed, SDA is, is doing seed testing. I don't know how long it takes. I know their seed testing procedure is based upon what they do for downy mildew and spinach. But, a grower could, but can we get that information that a grower could send that, where we could send that to get tested? Um, uh, yeah, I've, I've got that posted at that website I showed you. You can find it there, but maybe some of our seed company people have some comments. I mean, if a question comes in and someone else feels they can add to it, Please it's a workshop. This should be a discussion. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add? What's the website address? Um, if you just Google search vegetable MD online, basil downy mildew, you will pick it up. Maybe you could write down the website just later in the break on the poster. Yeah, okay. Uh, I just want to point out that um, we've run into a lot of problems with seed testing using uh, PCR to polymerize chain reaction. Um, it, it's, it's a relatively unreliable. The other thing that people need to keep in mind is that when you get positive results, doesn't mean that the pathogen is viable. Nevertheless, if you get positive results, it suggests that um, that that seed source wouldn't be appropriate because you couldn't take it and have a chance for it. So it's really quite difficult because, as you mentioned, this is an obligate parasite. We can't culture it. Uh, we have been able to use a centrifuge and spin seed down and detect the uh, organism with microscopy, but uh, this would be um, too labor intensive to do on a routine basis and 
the sample size uh, wouldn't be adequate to give uh, a diagnosis of, uh, of, of a high uh, uh, a high level of confidence. And that, so that's another problem is that uh, growers buy a large amount of seed uh, for uh, growing out, but these seed testing procedures rely or have to use a, a quite a small amount of seed. And, and we know that the distribution of the organism is unequal in the seed source. So, so again, the, the seed testing has been uh, quite difficult, and uh, I don't know uh, if we'll ever get to a place where we have a high level of confidence in, in ruling out uh, the, uh, the safetyness of the seed. Um, but I should add that, and this is my opinion, I don't know, uh, but these, these sporangia are going to be relatively short-lived, and I, I think that the um, this seed source issue is, is less of a problem. It certainly explains how it got from one continent to another. But I believe that uh, transplants are going rather large op operations and then distributed nationally are the real important source of this problem and why we had to, you alluded to that already, or why we had such a big problem this year. But I think that the environment is the most important source of this, where we should be uh, focusing most of our attention. Certainly the seed is important, but uh, I think it's far less important than environmental sources. Thanks, Bob. And, I, and I'd be, uh, I'll check this out myself, but I'd like to see what Seed Testing of America is doing. Uh, I don't know what they're doing with the, the, the uh, spinach. But, um, you know, probably the most effective way would be some kind of a grow-out test, which is kind of awkward and you'd need uh, isolated space and very good control of the environment. And, you know, it's, again, uh, the amount of seeds you can grow out is limited as well. But, um, and I'd be worried there of a a false negative, but you didn't have the right conditions. It's tricky. Yes, Tom? Yeah, maybe you had said, started out with saying that the source was probably the seed, which we all know is possible. Seed uh, versus environment versus time. So you said mostly set up and all around in your location is all. Now the growers that we are growing, you know, selling commercial seed to started planting the culture. Oh, get the if it's the seed, why is it not showing up in April, May, June, and July, and not until August? Is there not an environmental condition that has to be favorable? For field, for what I'm showing for field occurrence, definitely. But I think this past year, I, it's the only green. thing I could think of for why we had so much out there early in the season. You know, that being so widespread in greenhouses in, in April and you know, when they're producing plants to sell the gardens. I, I'm guessing. I was just guessing. And right, go ahead. Let Andy pick people. Yes, I, I'm going to be the guy who stands next to you so the mic picture questions up. Okay. We're recording. I'll get in just regarding the subject as far as is it. Uh, environmental conditions or is it seed borne? We've had the same growing the same variety in the greenhouse for seven and a half years and it has been tested by the University of Massachusetts about three years ago and it showed positive for downy mildew and it only gets it starts getting it in let's say early June almost every year when our outside conditions change and we can't control the relative humidity in the greenhouse again. Uh, and on that note I was just going to suggest that it, and it's again the greenhouse conditions Sometimes in April you get a very cloudy, dark, rainy condition, and if the grower is not on top of it, uh, a little relative, relative humidity climb, and then you'll start seeing downy mildew earlier than when we usually see it windborne in June, early June. Another comment is, my opinion, from our experience in the greenhouse, the 85% relative humidity to shoot towards a goal is way too high, because even if you get 75 to 78% in the greenhouse on your uh, Cloud of control computer where it's recording it, the in the leaf canopy it could be much higher than that. That's a really good point. It's the humidity level in the canopy, not what you're measuring in the air. I should have pointed that out. That's a really good point. 
Meg, could you just expand a little bit more on the type of lights you mentioned? Red lights, would those be LED? LED red lights are, are a good option. They're going to be the maybe the best, but the white lights work well. The advantage of something like an LED is you can have get the light level low enough that you're not impacting the growth of the plants. I think that's would those be uh, uh, metal halide or would they be uh, sodium or what? Would you say you have a white light? Or also LED? I guess it's somebody who knows a little bit more about lights than I do. Okay. No, it's, it's LED is LED, you know, sodium. Yeah, yeah, they're LEDs. But, but what more you need to know about that is, um, it's beyond my, I'm not a greenhouse person. Just on that subject, you try and put the, as Meg pointed out, the uh, advantage of the LED is you can get it down to a micromole level that will not start photosynthetic activity and still have that, amount, that small amount of light that will, should inhibit the growth of downy mildew. We'll find out. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, let's see. So we're greenhouse growers and don't have the option on, um, you know, working with the. I mean, we can control our environment a little bit. But uh, I was curious about steam treating of seed. Um, are there any practical uh, procedures or protocols that can be used for? Uh, I don't know, size-wise. You know, say like we go through maybe 10 million seed a year. Um, is there any way to, that we can effectively treat that in house? I don't know the protocol. I know that ENSA does seed treatment, um, whether or not that's proprietary. Um, that would be a question for Erica. ENSA, for Erica. <laughs> well, I know that in, in Europe it's common practice now, and it's a German company that does that, and a Swedish company. In the U.S., Incotech is developing that technology through um, an exclusivity with the Swedish company. So I don't know who actually does it in the U.S. We have ours done in Europe, and then it's brought over, and now it's common practice in what we do that all the seed is steam treated. So there's really no setup that maybe is suitable for you know moderate size operation to I, do I themselves. Think it's really new. It's really new, and I don't think they've adapted it to basil in the U.S. yet. Erica, do you think that they will take, do it as a service, and others that a grower might be able to ship seed and have it treated with income? Um. I know that I just after our conversation the other day I discussed it with them yesterday and they said they have not commercialized it yet for the US market but um, I think it's something that could be um, I'm sure they'll have minimums and so on and so forth but once they finalize the process I'm sure that they would they would do it for growers but I, so I not don't just for seed companies they'll do it for growers too. yeah but the minimums it's all about the minimum so you have to see how much they're willing to do and then it's probably best to collectively work with your seed company because the seed companies are doing contracts with the seed treatment companies and they can um, then ensure whatever you're purchasing uh, ha is steam treated I'm wondering about the viability of the spores, and I'm particularly concerned about uh, a situation where a grower in a greenhouse may find it there. Is it sufficient for him to have a basil-free period in that greenhouse, or must the house be cleansed? You know, so how long can we expect the spores to, be, to remain viable without the host? I don't know that that's been thoroughly enough looked at. I don't know, Rob, do you have any comments about length of time? I don't think it's a couple of days for sure. And heat will definitely knock them out, and that's been shown with the work done in Israel in heat up that greenhouse. Well, any more questions for Meg? We can continue the dialogue at lunch. It's a good discussion. Thank you, Meg.